Matters Committee will now get started. Thank you everyone for your attendance. Apologize for the slightly late start. I'm joined uh, by my colleagues, Alderman Pfeiffer, Alderman Arnett. Uh, we have a full agenda and uh, for us, a lot of people in the audience. <laughs> uh, we'll get started uh, with the minutes. We have two sets of minutes to approve for May and June. Uh, I move approval of both sets of minutes. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Legislation before the committee. Uh, we have first 03317 Stormwater Utility Fund. Do we have anyone from the administration like to talk about this? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the council, Maria Broadbent, Director of Office of Environmental Policy. Thank you for joining us. What Thank would you, you like to say about this ordinance? Uh, th this legislation is um, I in some ways a bit ceremonial. What, what it is is change in the name of that fund. You know, right now we're, we're calling it the Stormwater Fund, but that's not our ultimate goal. It's watershed protection, watershed improvement. So, you know, there are a number of things that we can do education-wise and, and branding and, and some other things. So um, I w was always really wanting to see that name changed. Great. Thank you very much. Any questions? The, uh, I have had some questions from constituents about um, how we distinguish, particularly in an accounting sense, but uh, even here with the name between the routine maintenance of gutters and catch basins and so forth and the proactive stormwater uh, management like the watershed improvement plan. Um, I'm not sure what to do with those comments, but I do understand them. Uh, I think as you said, Ms. Broadbent, we're going to be doing the same things uh, no matter what the name, but uh, uh, I guess we can try this out and see how it works, and then if there's some confusion, we can fix it later on. It, you know, and I think that kind of begs the, the mindset difference that w we might be hoping for. So, you know, some of those sort of traditional practices are really talking about the conveyance and the convey conveyance of the water from the, the streets and the land Mm -hmm. to the receiving waters as quickly as we can get it there. And, and there's always going to be a need for maintenance of those conveyance systems. Right. But over time, we're going to look at those conveyance systems a little differently and see if we can consider them watersheds and, Im and improve them. And, you know, and that's where the work happens on the receiving waters, where the outfalls are, how we can improve those streams, you know, all of those things associated with it. So, so, so that won't go away. But what we're really looking at is that fund that's coming from, you know, what we're calling the stormwater fee right now and making sure that we're thinking of that in terms of watershed improvement. Anything else? I would uh, move recommending approval to our colleagues on the council. Uh, before we vote, is there anyone else from the administration, Mr. Gutwald or Mr. Kissel on behalf of AEC that you intended to speak on this legislation? No? Very good. Um, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, motion passes. Thank you. Oh, um, Cindy, can I was surprised to not see my name on this. Uh, can you put that in the minutes and I'll bring it up at the council meeting. Sure. Thank you. Uh, moving on to uh, R2117, Stormwater Management Watershed Improvement Plan. Ms. Broban, I assume you're here to talk about this. Yep. Thank you. Again, this is um, all part of that same activity. You know, ultimately it looks like our goal is to uh, meet the conditions of our permit, but, you know, it really is to improve the watersheds, permit or otherwise. So we've been fortunate enough through um, some of the endorsements from this committee to, to get some funding so that we could fund the watershed improvement plan and um, do an inventory of, of all the things that exist, but also to give ourselves a guidance document that gives us options for a path forward. You know, and, and in that document, you know, it includes some ideas for, for funding, but it also um, gives some merit and, and some endorsement to all the partnerships that we work with. Um, you're going to hear this afternoon from from the interns from Back Creek Conservancy. 
they're one of our great partners in all of this effort. South River Federation, Spa Creek Conservancy, um, some of the churches through Alliance for Chesapeake Bay, St. Luke's. Um, but that's all part of this watershed improvement plan. Um, and because the appropriation in the watershed improvement plan budget goes towards this effort, um, one of the aldermen suggested that we actually adopt it. So that's why this is here. So besides being a requirement that we needed to do this to comply with state requirements, what does this the WIP actually accomplish? So it, it gives us uh, a sense of what our starting point is because when, when, they're new, when our new stormwater permit, the municipal separate storm sewer system MS4 permit comes out, the very first requirement in that permit is going to be to inventory your in existing conditions. We're, we're one step ahead of the game. That will be what you have to do in the first year. And, and that information gets used to determine what your requirement is for treating impervious surface that was created after 2006. So for us, that initial number um, was 300 something. It's down to about 250 now. So this gives us a chance to have projects that are at least um, fleshed out enough that we um, have identified possible projects one of which we've gotten a grant for in the Ambridge neighborhood, I think in um, Alderman Pfeiffer's ward. Um, it gives us a better leg up for those. It gives us um, something that has some structure and some intent. Um, it, it's the first step in all of our permit requirements. Okay. Um, what is the next step after passing the whip? Us making it happen. Okay. And more specifically? So the budget put aside a um, million dollars towards watershed improvement projects. And more than that, I think. The million, yeah. the million dollars was the borrowed amount, but there's also an increase in the fee. Also an increase in the fee. So we have uh, six minimum measures, which are sort of the six things that we have to work on that are requirements of our MS4 storm sewer permit. And this is covers several of those in different ways. So it would be for staff to take the money in the budget and in the best way we can make sure that we're covering those six minimum measures, one of which is treating 20% of our impervious surface. So we're looking at uh, the possibility of a public-private partnership. We've, we've accepted uh, qualifications from a couple of different firms and looking at that's sort of the the process that Prince George's County has used and, and looking to see if that's the right way for us to go because sometimes they can spend our money faster um, so that's that's one of the things that we're looking at and then any number of the other things that we need to do for the other minimal measures like good housekeeping and some of those things you know it's um, the job of my office to make sure that everybody in the city that needs to works on all, all those efforts together. So we work closely with Public Works where we need to wreck and parks, transportation. Um, okay. Those are the, the major ones. Alderman Arnett. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, d a couple of things. One, I'm kind of surprised that none of our names are on this legislation. I'd certainly like to r remedy that. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Broadbent mentioned uh, the dollars, and I mentioned it in the earlier question. Uh, <clears throat> since I'm the only one on this group that seems to have a taste for returning, and that's not a given, but uh, um, I think that we, w in the future of this committee, we will have to be monitoring to be sure there's enough money to accomplish all of these different projects. Um, I acquiesce to smaller increases in the fees because we don't know how much money is going to be available from grants and private right. public-private partnerships and even just private like uh, St. Luke's Church uh, kinds of projects so um, I, I do think this is something where we need to keep our eye on the dollars 
both to make sure we have enough and also to make sure that they don't get screeded off for the routine maintenance, which while important, is separate from this. That, uh, this is over and above that. So uh, uh, again, Cindy, I would appreciate at least any my name to this. Thank you. Any, Mr. Scott Walt, anything? Okay. Um, did you I move, the move we uh, recommend approval to the council. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. None opposed? Thank you. And uh, last for legislation is R2217, uh, the UN Paris Climate Agreement. This has um, been through public hearing, obviously, come through us. Um, at From the, this committee already took up this legislation once and frankly I'm forgetting what we did with it but I, I wanted to come back because uh, my recommendations uh, for amendments from that our last time we took this up and the public hearing and then written comments that came after the public hearing so after going through uh, all those comments with Ms. Broadbent and Ms. Lee uh, from the law office I came up with the uh, proposed Lipman proposed amendments that I'd ask uh, the committee to review for consideration the, um, if there's no questions so far, I'll just go into the amendment. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Amendment number one, uh, Mr. we had- Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, if I may- Please. I, I've had uh, two interns that have been working with the Office of Environmental Policy, uh, and they've done some research on this, and, and if it's all right with you, I'd like to give them five minutes to talk a little bit about the Paris Accord and um, be our pleasure. what it means to have them the mayor and the council sign on to that. Happy you to want do to do that Happy first to do that or? And then we'll get into the amendments. Okay. All right. Introduce yourself. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the council. My name is Clifford Wells. And I'm Baird Miser. Um, we Thank are both member, or we're both interns at the Office of Environmental Policy. And we're here to speak to you about the Paris Climate Agreement and um, Annapolis's resolution to adapt it. Thank you. So the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2010 released a study of reviewing um, the different climatologists in the field and whether or not they accept anthropogenic climate change or not. And the study showed that a wide consensus among the most experienced climatologists um, agree that human-induced greenhouse gas emissions are causing atmospheric global warming effect. This effect has um, some pretty severe impacts, including sea level rise, desertification, increased frequency and severity of natural disasters, um, as seen locally in events like Hurricane Sandy and uh, Hurricane Isabel. The first global initiative to curb emissions and limit the impacts of climate change was the Kyoto Protocol of 1997 in which a binding agreement was made between mostly developed nations to cap and limit uh, carbon emissions. Preceding the Kyoto Protocol was the Paris Climate Agreement, which was drafted in the winter of 2015 by the UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, contrasting the Kyoto Protocol, it was a non-binding agreement, uh, wherein 196 countries, through um, individually determined emission reduction goals, depending on local situations, um, aimed to limit warming well below two degrees Celsius from pre-industrial levels with a more ambitious target goal of limiting it below 1.5 degrees Celsius. In June 1st of this year, our president announced his intent to withdraw the United States from the Paris Climate Agreement However, in response, mayors from around our nation um, joined forces to create the mayor's national climate action agenda, committing their jurisdictions to upholding uh, the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. Right now, there are 359 climate mayors or signatories nationwide, with five in Maryland, those being the mayors of Baltimore, Greenbelt, Hyattsville, Tacoma Park, and Salisbury. Annapolis has its own climate action plan. Um, it's divided into two levels. The 
first being the city government goals as well as community goals. And the city level, we seek a 75% reduction of our 2006 greenhouse gas emission levels by 2025 with the end goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. The community goals, we seek a 50% reduction of these 2006 levels by 2025 with a common end goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. On this slide here, we have a list of signatory targets. They include cities within our state, as well as others comparable to the city of Annapolis. You may reference this um, information in the handout we have provided in the back of the room. Can I ask you a question about that last slide? Mm -hmm. Do you know if those percent targets are for the city governments or for the uh, community-wide um, entities? It didn't specify but I believe it's for the municipality as a whole. Okay. And then just some examples of what uh, municipal governments have started to do to uphold uh, the goals of the Paris Agreement. In Baltimore, they have started uh, making the transition to renewable energy sources more affordable for all of their residents, as well as initiated a promotion campaign for citywide composting, sustainable land development, and the supporting of local agriculture. Up north in Burlington, Vermont, uh, they've started adding to their uh, existing pretty expansive uh, bike paths, as well as started an electric bus pilot program, both of which will help uh, cut transportation emissions in the city. And down south in Asheville, North Carolina, they've begun energy retrofitting low-income housing to ensure that all residents um, have access to emission-reducing technology. Thank you for your time, and we hope to see this resolution through. Great. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Forman, anything else before we continue? No, I, I wanted to just share with you that, um, you know, these these two gentlemen have been spending the summer with us a couple days a week, um, work on a variety of things, you know, part of which is a grant that we got from Maryland Environmental Trust and uh, working on some things with the, our Conservancy Board and you'll hear a little bit more about their, their work in a minute or two, but sure. um, it's appreciate great, their, to, ha great uh, to have them. Appreciate Jesus. your presentation and input. Thank you for joining us today. Well done. Okay. Um, picking back up from the amendments, amendment number one actually intends to add two thoughts to this. One, it, it is uh, my desire for this legislation to remind city government that it is our goal not just to improve energy efficiency from <coughs> city government itself, but to provide information and guidance and perhaps even incentives for private citizens and businesses to do the same. And that was uh, captured by a few of the comments that we got as well because it, it lacked that thought initially. So that's the first half of that addition in amendment number one. The second one was uh, we got another can, suggestion. Can you uh, sure. speak to what kinds of incentives we might be able to put into effect? I mean, I, I like the words, mm -hmm. but I just wonder what the uh, meat of it is. So the be. meat of it will have to be decided by a future council on specific legislation that would provide those incentives. But examples could be a um, reduction, just like we have the um, for stormwater, now uh, waste, uh, now watershed restoration, we have a discount if you do install rain barrels and yeah. rain gardens. That's the kind of incentive I would, be, I would think of, but of course for energy efficiency, not for watershed restoration. So would that be like solar panels? Solar or? panels, um, recycling collection, private businesses are not required to recycle uh, in the city, Okay. whereas we require uh, mm -hmm. citizens to do the same. Okay. Um, I think the uh, recycling is something where we might not need to do an incentive. You just need to provide um, information and a requirement and make sure availability right. exists. So, so I, I guess those are good examples. Um, it feels like we need some, maybe for the next council, additional actions that actually put that in place. I think that's right. I think anything we do and that for incentive is most likely it'll have a budget impact, either mm -hmm. a uh, cost of providing a service or a reduction in taxes collected as a as a discount. Or or in what's that? Or something that we do that makes it easier. Right. Eliminate, <laughs> you know, we, yeah. eliminate a hurdle. You know that sometimes Wait a minute. 
We're not supposed to make it easier, are we? <laughs> um, well, yeah, we can actually. Um, you know, we actually combined some permits, you know, way back when, um, but combined solar panel permits so you don't need a building permit and an electrical permit. You know, you only need one permit. You know, we were working with MEA so that the whole portal for getting those permits, you can go to the state and get all of the tax credits at the sense. same time. Yeah. So, so some of it could be just us clearing some roadblocks and make things easier for people. I think other jurisdictions have really um, thought creatively on how to address incentives. Things like um, incentives for businesses to have either uh, ride sharing or um, other than single use cars in their parking lot all day. But so to encourage if you have more bike paths and more walking paths then you make it easier for businesses. So right. A, eliminating some hurdles and then it could also be providing incentives to do those sort of think things. Think of Volkswagen's uh, goofing up with the whole emission thing is actually mm -hmm. going to send some money our way for more plug-in stations. Okay. But I guess um, it could be what Ms. Thompson has always advocated, which is putting more of the um, electric uh, hybrid, or the, not the hybrid, but the electric vehicle stations around the city. So that, mm -hmm. That's what I mean, the charging Yeah, I just oh, hope I'm sorry. That, yeah. I'm sorry. You were going to say? No, I'm saying, no, I'm just, I'm just, I mean, that's a real opportunity that's going to happen because of that settlement, that there's going to be settlement. money for cities in the near term. So it's a real tangible thing that could happen. So, but if we come become the 360th city to sign on, it's all nice words and thoughts and sentiments. Um, I just fear that unless there's some sort of uh, united action on, on the part of all the mayors, uh, that it'll go on the shelf and um, say, yeah, we did our thing and sure. now we can go on. So I, I think your fear is justified. And yeah. And it'll be up to uh, our future council members to um, to continue that this path, making sure we're that the uh, that we have people in the city that have the funds to pursue these these points. So the the second thought in Amendment Number One, someone made the um, recommendation that we commit to replacing our automobiles with either electric or hybrid, and I was surprised to find out that apparently we already had that requirement. <laughs> It's section 10.36.03. It's in the code. It's in the code array. So here I'm not suggesting we do anything other than say, we already require this. Pay attention right. and we need to fund it. Council right. and mayor and administration need to um, point, the, you know, make sure we don't miss things like this. We need that uh, guidance and kind of carrot and stick. So this is just a reminder we already have this requirement and so hopefully we'll do a better job following it. Uh, amendment number two. Um, somewhat self-explanatory the first part about um, things that we are, should do is to expand and protect our wetlands and living shorelines. Um, I think that is um, pretty self-explanatory. We had gotten a couple people from the AEC pointing out that when we we already have in uh, in our plans to integrate solar but we have as backup battery backup and so here the thought is to rather than to encourage battery backup which is still could be energy intensive to encourage uh, geothermal but knowing that there's, uh, there's always going to be a place for one option or the other, I, my suggestion is to leave it as preferred and secondary as, to, as opposed to taking out battery backup at all. Um, amendment number three is uh, we, frankly, in drafting this, I forgot a sort of key point that was the goal, and that is to get the mayor to sign the mayor's national climate action agenda. Right. <laughs> and um, obviously, we can't force his hand, but I think this is the strongest language we can uh, put in to express the sense of the City Council that the Mayor shall endorse said, uh, said action agenda on behalf of the City Council. Right. So, I, pre yeah. okay. <laughs> I appreciate him getting that, that uh, suggestion. Always happy. Uh, I'd rather be wrong and have someone cr make a correction than be right and have it not be as good. So uh, those are the amendments that I have written. There's two other, and maybe we should just vote on that. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to move uh, the Lippman Amendments 1 through 3. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. None opposed? Thank you. Happy to have co-sponsors too if anyone wants to add their names to it. Yep, I will. Thank you, thank you. All right, so two amendments, more thoughts that I think this committee should discuss. One is uh, one of the comments we got during the public hearing and then Alderman Arnett asked for a follow-up which we received was for the city to begin to track citywide emissions. 
and it could be the smaller level would be to track city government emissions, the wider would be citywide emissions. And um, Ms. Broadman and I have discussed that, and I don't, I don't, nothing from that discussion led me to have a specific language that I think that I could add, but in rereading the gentleman's uh, email I received and reading the links that he sent to us, I see that other governments are doing this already. And it really makes a lot of sense. If we're going to go on record in whatever time, whenever the solar uh, farm gets um, online, for instance, and say, hey, we reduced our emissions, it would be nice to know what the starting point was and uh, what we, the reduction was. We have was. that already. There, a tracking? Yeah. So when we did our um, community action plan, it was based on a baseline. So we did baseline information actually from 2006. And we've done a couple of report cards. Yeah, it's all on the Office of Environmental Policy's website. So we did a climate action plan. We've done a couple of report cards. Um, we just had to rearrange some staff assignments, so we haven't been doing them as frequently. Okay. Um, but we do actually have that, and we've converted the energy use to greenhouse gas emissions, and, and we have a plan that has a whole First. bunch of different items in it. For citywide or city government? Uh, we have both. Okay. Uh, how, how do you measure it? You, you take the energy usage and you convert it through some formulas. The, oh, okay. The one that was the, the big deal at the time was the one from ICLE. From what? ICLE. ICLE yeah. yeah, it's an international organization. Um, there are lots of them out there now. You know, at the time that was, we were one of the first pilot communities actually to use their software. So after the first of the calendar year, we will do another update and another report of our energy usage and greenhouse gas emissions. So when's the last report, when was the last report done? 2012, so it's been a few years. We, we cannot do it annually, we just don't have the staff to do it. Even getting the information from BG&E on the community level is really difficult to do. So that would just capture electricity usage citywide, not car emissions? No. Instance? So for the city government is the one that, you know, really requires our focus mostly because we have the most influence on that and your budget does. But it's it's not only your electricity use, but it's your your fuels of all kinds. So it looks at transportation, it looks at um, heating and cooling, it looks at, you know, those kinds of things. So, you know, we can take into account not only what we're using, but, um, you know, at some point, hopefully, we'll have some actual numbers from the solar energy park that can be put in back into that, too. Okay. So, yes, we do actually have target numbers and original baseline information that we will do an update on after the first of the calendar year. So since it hasn't been done in five years, perhaps this resolution should just um, commit to doing a new benchmark mm -hmm. in 2018, by 2018, to update our report. We, we won't be able to start it until after the first of the year. Right, so 2018. Yeah, calendar 2018. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. That's our that's our target. Okay. You know, we also want to make sure that we're looking at our um, community action plan to make sure that the things that we recommended are are still the best recommendations. All right. So this would go in as a therefore. Yeah. Exactly. So I think what the uh, the addition would be is and say between lines uh, 16 and 17, and be it further resolved by the Annapolis City Council that the City of Annapolis continues to support benchmark benchmarking its citywide emissions and commits to doing an update by the end of 2018. I second that motion. Um, did, Cindy, did you get that, the thrust of that? Cindy, did you get that recorded? Great. Okay, great. Thank you. And any? Uh, and I, I think we need. We should discuss. It, it seems to me like it needs some broader dissemination, unless you happen to be 
strolling through the city's website. I think it sure. should be a public report or something to that effect. That's a good point. Any uh, responses so, for me? So the reports are are public, but because we haven't done one for a while, you know, I mean, maybe you want to just say that whenever we do the report card that we make it known or something, you know, so that... Report back to the Environmental Matters Committee? Yeah, that'd be a good way to do it, just to make sure that, um, you know, we're reporting back to the elected body, mm -hmm. right. you know. Right. Okay. So, yeah. Just tack on that and report it to the Environmental Matters Committee of the City Council by um, the end of 2018. But yeah, that, that would make sense to me. When, when we did it originally, we did, um, I'm actually a big fan of outreach and input, mm -hmm. um, and we did input and outreach across the city. We had people in this council chambers that had never been here before. Mm -hmm. We went to all the churches. We, you know, took people out for a ride. You know, we, we went and looked in a pretty broad way, and we did not in exclude any of the suggestions that the community gave us in the climate action plan. So what we what we need to do is update that to make sure that those are still what the community recommends and right. that they're the best recommendations but at the same time do the greenhouse gas inventory and energy use report card. So then the second thought that I didn't have in writing because I don't really have it formally that I wanted to discuss with the uh, council members and, and administration is the thought of how can we encourage the administration and council to make sure we put the resources into getting these things pursued, done, centralize the efforts. Um, the, the title of um, Director of Resiliency came up in some of the input, um, which I all think is good, but I don't think we can just do in this resolution, and I don't want to do it in any sort of rushed, unthoughtful way. So I just wanted to express that somehow and look for suggestions on how we could do better. If I may, um, so resiliency has come up uh, in my experience most frequently with sea level rise, but I don't think that's the only right. aspect of resiliency. No. Um, right. And I, I do have some concerns right now. Sea level rise lives primarily out of planning and zoning, and I'm not necessarily opposing that, but it seems to me like there's some cross cuts with. <coughs> things that you do too, Maria, so... Uh, it, it's technically in the Office of Environmental Policy. Okay. That That is how it is organized in the charter and the code. Um, certainly there's been some efforts in planning and zoning, you know, on the part of Chief of Historic Preservation, but those things do technically fall under the Office of Environmental Policy. Um, the last uh, presentation at the hotel downtown there was a whole listing of things that were considered um, for recommendations half of those things are already in that climate action plan so right. a lot of those are are not new the whole greenhouse gas emission inventory all of those they're already in that plan so it's a, it's really a matter of making sure that the office of environmental policy has enough capacity to make sure that we can keep those things going and make sure that stuff gets implemented. So as this is a resolution, there's not an ordinance, so we're not creating a position, but uh, there's also been a lot of activity involved with this, uh, with the Office of Emergency Management as a part of the FEMA. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think my sense would be that I'd like to have something in here that recommends creating this resiliency position uh, that the council uh, consider creating the resiliency position in the next council um, mm -hmm. and at that point we'll have to take uh, into account the cross-cutting uh, reporting uh, kinds of things but your office is designed to be yeah I think this position actually already is that right you know but right. if the office of environmental policy needed so or staff to carry out some of those things that that would that would be you know 
so it already the, is a position in the city manager's office. The resolve would be that the city uh, make room in the uh, fiscal 19 budget to create uh, uh, either position or uh, could be contract funds for a resiliency uh, capacity or I don't know exactly how we want to word it but uh, something along that nature and, and I like this because it's proactive mm -hmm. um, it's not just saying we want to do nice things it's a specific nice thing that we need to do right so I, I don't know how you want to word it exactly but I think yeah, it would be yeah. what if it was explore the need what's that what if it was explore the need still can't hear you explore the need so committing the council or you know whether resolving to explore the need for <coughs> additional capacity to compare carry out the things that are in the resolution as a whole do we call it resiliency capacity i mean well not everything in this ordinance right. applies to that i would right. think it's it's more related to the ordinance in general the resolution I'm so the um, I'm just thinking out loud um, resolving for the City Council to uh, take steps to adequately fund itself basically it to, to fund the city efforts to comply with all of the recommendations in the resolution in the resolution right. it's that, that, that covers it I mean the, yeah. the general idea is right if we're gonna say we should do all these things which we have a habit of doing and then we, you don't actually put it on anyone's particular plate or give them the resources to do it from a staff point of view right. often doesn't get done so if you think these things are important and we're setting things we want to see happen you should but make it a priority to put it's kind of in, in here people. line uh, on um, page three. Uh, three in line 27 we do, we do talk about resiliency maybe it's in addition to that uh, further resolve um, maybe a last sentence saying that the uh, charging the council to right um, have on line 28 where it says we'll take steps to protect maybe between uh, after we'll take new steps and we'll adequately fund efforts to protect, protect and enhance yeah I like that so it would just be an amendment on line 28 yeah. <coughs> All right. Okay. All those okay yeah, that sounds good. All right. So I um, guess I'm looking for a motion to amend page three, line 28, to insert after the phrase, take new steps, the phrase, and adequately fund. I think that's it. It'd be. Fund. I was going to say fund that we're staff, but right. maybe fund. Fund, I think, covers it, whether it's yeah. the uh, right. new staff or. Right. Um, so moved. Right. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, those are the main thoughts I had. Um, I think that captures. I've continued to receive a number of emails, and so I might not. I'm not swearing to tackling every single one, but I think I've captured the essence of what I'm getting the majority of. Um, so at this point, I would move that we recommend favorably to the City Council this resolution 2217 with the amendments that we have proposed from the Environmental Matter Committee today. Thank you. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 None opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. That was a healthy discussion. Um, moving on to general discussion. First up is the AEC. Ms. Brobert, thank you for your time and participation on that. Uh, my name is Rick Kissel. I'm the is, make sure your mic is on, please. The green light's on. You good. Just move it closer. Thank you. Yeah. How's that? Mr. Murphy, we'll let you introduce yourself as well, please. Sure. Do you want to use the system? Okay. Paul Murphy, 105 Northwest Street. R Rick Kissel, 717 Warren Drive. Uh, what I'm going to talk about really is kind of a heads up. Uh, at our next meeting, uh, and possibly uh, after that, it's not decided yet, uh, we're going to have a presentation from a company called Capital Flexi Pave. They produce permeable rubber pavement products uh, for, uh, to protect city streets, uh, city tree streets, I'm sorry, 
City. Street trees. Street trees. Right. That, you know. <laughs> City trees. Try to say that fast. Anyway, um, we haven't locked in this presentation yet, um, but uh, we're going to try to get them for our August meeting. And they currently have a, an ongoing contract with the uh, uh, DC Department of Transportation to replace pavement around all of their street trees. And we're wondering, well, maybe we would like to have them here. Uh, anyway, I bring this up to you because we will um, we'll send you a, an email on this, but I would like to receive any, I'd like to receive any questions you have about this before they come so that we can be sure to have good answers to your questions. Anyway, we'll send out an email to you as soon as we firm up the, uh, the date and uh, we'd really like to have your input to this. Can we ask a couple of quick questions? Uh, you may go right ahead, I'll jot them down. Uh, uh, what does it look like and will it work downtown where everything is brick? Uh, from what I understand, they look just like brick. But, uh, Paul, do you know any difference to that? I've I heard can't that. Speak for, I, no. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we'll find that out. We'll okay. have nice pictures for Thank sure. Thank you. Uh, I already put that question down. I don't, any others? Okay. Um, well, yeah, if we, um, well, I'll look forward to your update in September when, when our next meeting is going to be on what you learn in August. Right. Second of August, right? Yeah, we, okay. this committee does it. No, no committee meets in uh, August. No committee meeting for you in August. Right? Exactly. Commissions still could we're, feel we're free to so, do business. We're not so fortunate. Or yeah, you don't. Uh, <laughs> uh, Paul, did you have anything you want to add? A um, couple of updates, and you know, we have a. We should have a wider portfolio. A few topics have occupied more of our time over the last few years, but in addition to the other items. Um, I was very keen two years ago, and I am sad to not be able to report much more progress. The C bin, you know, the trash canner mm -hmm. with a waterproof uh, or a, a water, yeah, waterproof uh, electric motor, must be a small startup struggling to raise money because they are just limping along. So I, 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 w I was hoping a year ago we'd have them. I didn't, and they're not here. So. Maria, have you had any positive news from them lately? I have not. They, they have not had any UL listing testing or um, anything that would allow the city to install it, even if they donated one. It, it's, got a, it's got a ways to go. The city is perfectly willing to purchase one when they are available to be purchased. But, I mean, I speak to people with knowledge. They're not, I mean, electricity and water, yeah, that seems like a piece to be concerned about, but speaking to people with knowledge on that, they're like, there's all sorts of examples where this works fine and has gone through UL labs and, you know, whether it has to be a $1,800 device instead of a $1,600 device because they doubled the cost of the motor, it, it's not going to affect the impact that these could have in our areas because I will just say, well, as an AEC member and a, a citizen, city dock in the summer, the water is disgusting. And I, I'm not looking at you like it's your problem. I'm just saying all of us, I mean, if you want to look around at the, you know, every town has impact, uh, but city dock is disgusting. So the water, and that doesn't drive any more tourism. It doesn't turn, it doesn't make this town any more appealing. So I don't know how all of the city deploys their resources in the most efficient manner, but the pool skimming net, boom, into a trash can. It's a little bit of manual, manual labor, but uh, particularly during the peak uh, summer where the water's warmer, more things grow, more people. Uh, I sure got to think compared to treescapes and flowers downtown and all the nice, all the great things we do, um, uh, you know, I, up to other people, you cut the circulator off 10 minutes early, whatever, find some money and make a uh, city dock look a little less disgusting. 
and I'm to the point with CBEN, they're welcome to say no, but I'm going to send them an email and say, can we just build this thing in the States and give you a licensing fee? Give them credit, God, you know, for them to come up with a clever idea. I want them to make some money, but we can't sit around for two years and have an idea not happen. So anyways, that's it on CBIN, but as I talk to people through the marinas, and, and uh, marinas, yacht clubs, uh, waterfront property developments, you know, there ought to be the Naval Academy, they, they, we could have 40 or 50 of those things in this town, you know. Um, so that's that. My interest in the AEC is probably two stronger areas making renewable energy more affordable and or, or, or deploying it where it does economically make sense and the other one is as you were talking about automobiles I would love to see and there as you were saying earlier there's some stuff already in the code that we may not have been aware of um, incentives for example the old Hopkins furniture the uh, resident plan near Adams Ribs. It may not be as, you know, it, I've noticed that developers seem to want to make bigger than the citizens want, so uh, there's some compromise. But it would be interesting if we had some micro vehicles, and I don't just mean an electric vehicle like, you know, the Camry, uh, Tesla's Camry killer comes out in, you know, this fall. Um, but the glorified golf carts, the e-cruisers, or a shuttle bus, I, could, I would think the demographics of empty nesters and affluent people, um, if we had some smaller vehicles, not just electric, right, they could be propane or, you know, whatever, they're not going to be hydrogen for another 20 years, but um, smaller vehicles and then somehow give them the, incentivize those because they're just, you know, call them a grocery grabber. You just need to go from Eastport Shopping, maybe Edgewood Road to, uh, to Fado's. A smaller vehicle, which is going to have less congestion, park, you know, 10 of them parked is going to take up less than 10 Suburbans. Um, it's going to enhance the city and some type of incentives with your units versus parking lot requirements, whether it's a, b and uh, I guess this would be primarily- Ms. Murphy, I need you to wrap up. Well, okay. yeah. well that, that is something I would like to see, um, and for the larger units like the one in Eastport, I, I could see increasing density if they uh, committed to having a dedicated shuttle bus going through town, a cleaner one, but you know, running from Adams Ribs into up to Fado's or something, and I think people, there's too many small trips where we're using too big of cars, and looking where the future is Ms. Murphy, Ms. Murphy, yeah. I, I really need you to wrap up, please. Okay, well, that, that's what I'm talking about. These are some of the things that I think we need to communicate further because I don't know the code part. Well, you, you need to bring a proposal to us. I'm, uh, I don't know enough to give you a proposal or a, a, uh, a recommendation. I'm floating the trends that are out there and they're done in other cities. So, But what I would say, a, an incentive in the units versus parking lot parking spots required ratio to make it um, to incentivize people to use these smaller vehicles. Okay, thank That's, you. I don't okay. know enough to dig further. I'd be okay, happy to talk to you later. Thank you, Jay. Ms. Broadbent, any response? Like we talked about before, when we're looking at updating the community action plan, um, that's the kind of input from the community that we can translate into um, interest that the community has and, and then give the mayor and council some suggestions for programs and policies and things that might be able to translate some of those into action. So that, that's what those plans are for. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Murphy and Mr. Mm -hmm. Kissel. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, David is We're going to uh, take the agenda slightly out of order to pick up uh, ID 27017 next, Back Creek Summer Intern Projects. Mr. Baker, if you and your team would like to come up.
Mr. Chairman, while, while they're getting set up, thank you for giving them some time on, on the agenda. Uh, Mr. Barker told me last year that he was going to have he was going to have five interns for the summer, and I said, "Well, who's going to be working with the interns?" And he decided he was going to do that himself. So here he is back again for a uh, uh, second summer, and um, I did have the pleasure of having lunch with with last year's interns um, and their parents and. Um, with some of the partners that David works with, and uh, very, very impressive. And um, David and Back Creek is a really great partner with the city, and I appreciate him bringing them in so they can talk to you about what they're doing. Terrific. Mr. Baker and uh, interns, because I don't know your names yet, I am uh, very happy to have you all here. Um, appreciate uh, listening to what you have. I'll just if I'm rushing you, don't take it personally. I have a half an hour and three more agenda items to cover, so go for it. Yes, sir. Uh, listen, thank you very much. Uh, Alderman uh, Barnett, Alderman Spicer, thank you. Um, my name is David Barker. I am the chairman of the Back Creek Conservancy. We are now three years old. We've been working for three summers to understand what is going on in Back Creek. Back Creek is the heart and soul of the recreational boating industry in the city of Annapolis. It is the source of perhaps as many as 2,000 jobs. There are 64 uh, businesses uh, in the maritime industry on the shores of Back Creek. So although Back Creek is just like 2,000 other creeks in the Chesapeake Bay, it is the basis of Annapolis's reputation as the sailing capital of the nation. So what happens in Back Creek is very important. The creek is impaired severely for nutrients, for phosphorus and nitrogen, for sediments, and for toxins. So we started uh, last year uh, to develop a watershed action plan, which now has a complete inventory of best management practices and lots and lots of opportunities for improvement there. We have a shoreline stewardship project underway designed to encourage waterfront property owners to increase resilience in, their pro in the buffer zone of their properties through green infrastructure investments. We have an active water quality monitoring program underway and we are the instigator of the Anne Arundel Clean Boating Coalition, which is aiming at increasing health and safety of boating, including the eventual adoption of a no discharge zone. So our second annual summer institute, we have four interns. Uh, two are working primarily uh, on um, water quality monitoring, and two are working on drones. We have make an, made a tremendous effort to adopt and deploy and promote very advanced environmental technologies for the monitoring work that we do. And I'd like to have them introduce themselves and talk to you for a minute about that. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Jordan Long, a rising senior at South River High School. I'm in the SEM program. And I am one of the two interns working on water quality data. Uh, currently, I am working with Dr. Barker on a water quality study design manual, which will be submitted to the EPA and to the Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative, which we hope to be a Tier 1 member of. Um, tier 1 status requires that we are able to provide water quality data that will be relevant to for educational purposes and also provide um, a basis of conditions currently in Back Creek. Um, some of the things that we have to, that we are currently measuring are pH, water clarity, turbidity, salinity, and overall water temperature. Thank you.
Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Philip Archuleta. I am a rising senior at Top River High School, and I come to you today uh, pretty sunburned. That's because over the last few weeks, I've been working at Back Creek with uh, this tour right here to monitor the water quality within the creek and surrounding areas, including the mouth of the Severn River. What we're finding here, especially through our process of monitoring, is that in the upper meter or two of Back Creek, you're getting temperatures around the upper 20s or lower 30s, which anything above 30 degrees Celsius is pretty much a dead zone for every living organism. And then at the bottom of Back Creek, we're seeing very low dissolved oxygen levels, which is also a dead zone for Back Creek. Uh, so overall, from the top to the bottom, you're getting these situations where nothing can really live there. And it's really vital that we do something to fix that because if we don't, uh, it will continue to be a dead zone for indefinite period of time. Uh, as of right now, it's not swimmable, and it's going to continue to stay like that until some action is taken. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the committee and Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Austin Gordon, and I'm from South River High School in the STEM program. So my job as a Back Creek intern is the head of drone operations. So what I do is I get to fly this DJI Phantom 3 quadcopter around and capture video of the shoreline. It's a really great tool because we can capture much more shoreline much quicker than we'd be able to traditionally do, like with the boat on video. While we're flying, we also are focused on safety procedures and always consider privacy as one of our number one priorities. We want to make sure that the residents don't feel violated by our filming of the shoreline. We want to monitor the shoreline, the three types, the bulkhead, the riprap, and the living shoreline without them having concerns. So um, when you say monitor the shoreline, are, I mean, you, I hope you're not seeing changes in the shoreline, are you, with the drone? Uh, we've just recently started monitoring the shoreline, so we haven't seen any changes yet, but we'll see where it goes. All right, thank you. I, I'm kind of curious before you move on, how, when you monitor, what are you able to see with the drone? Are you measuring somehow? We don't have any quantitative data, but we're able to qualitatively analyze it to see what's growing and what's not. Uh, okay. Um, Mr. Bigger, maybe Ms. Broadman, maybe they should be in touch with um, Sean Wampler and her GIS systems to um, be able to maybe capture some of the information they're getting to use as baseline, because she can probably capture and draw a line and see uh, more from one frame to the next. I'm going to let Mr. Barker answer that, because this is all part of this um, really great tool that the community can use. That's one of the things that's be the outcome of that. Uh, Chairman Whitman, I appreciate your suggestion. Uh, at the beginning of this month, uh, we have a new staff person uh, recently from the Watershed Stewards Academy. Laura Mulvaney has joined us as a GIS expert. Oh, great. She has bonded with Sean Wampler, we're working <laughs> shoulder to shoulder, Good. they are. Perfect. And we are intensively mapping with the drone, everything is geolocated so that we can inventory the shoreline uh, completely. Glad you're here. And I think the, the final proof is with Ada. Good afternoon, my name is Ada Garcia and I'm I am a rising junior at Anamalik High School. I am glad of being part of Back Creek Conservancy where I have been learning new stuff as the, I am the videographer <laughs> of the internship and what I do is edit videos that are taken with the drone. Our purpose is to persuade people by the videos to keep our base clean and take the environment as a priority because a lot of people don't and don't realize how little by little we're destroying our environment. Mm. Uh, we want to post the videos in a YouTube channel at the end of the summer so we can show to everybody what we have done and what we want to achieve. Thank you. Terrific. Very nice presentations uh, today from uh, the four of you and plus the two of you. Uh, it's, a, it's a treat for us. Hopefully, uh, I know you all must enjoy being outside and on the creek, but hopefully on this 100 degree day, it's not so bad being inside <laughs> talking to us with the air conditioning. Um, any follow-up? Thank you for volunteering. Yeah. Yes. 
thank you very much and thanks for coming in and sharing with us what you're doing so keep up the good work thank you thank, thank you, you. I think we should take up next uh, ID 253.17, presentation by the Annapolis Conservancy Board. Sure. Mr. Chairman, members of the council, um, Thank you for offering some time on your agenda. We all know how valuable that time is, but I wanted to uh, bring Joanna Ogburn, who's the, the chair of the Conservancy Board, um, in front of you so that you get a sense of um, some really great things that they're doing now. We've um, getting some really great momentum going, and, and it's it's probably one of the quieter boards that's that's out there. So. Uh, we're not always, you know, familiar with what it is that they're doing. So, um, Joanna's been the chair just for the last few months or so. Um, thanks for the chance. Turn your you. Welcome. Appreciate oh, you joining us you. today. Yeah, so good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me here today. Again, I'm Joanna Ogburn. I'm the chair of the Annapolis Conservancy Board. And we also have the vice chair, Meg Hosmer, who's back here as well. Um, and Maria serves as our city liaison. It's been wonderful to be working with her. Great. We currently have a full board, so we have seven members, and that's the first time it's been a full board in a while, I think, uh, about halfway through last Can year. I, I'm glad you raised that. I meant to ask mm -hmm. when the AEC was here. Is the AEC also full? Is, are, do you have full membership or do you have any vacancies? Full membership. Thank you. Yeah. Great. I'm sorry. Great. No, no problem. Um, as you all might know, the board was created by the City Council in 1988 from legislation submitted by former Mayor Ellen Moyer. Uh, it's actually a pretty unique entity among those working in land conservation. We were the first municipally owned and operated public land trust in Maryland, and some think maybe the country, although I don't think that's verified, so I wouldn't print that anywhere. <laughs> um, so we are considered in a way a public urban land trust, which is fairly unique. Our purpose is primarily twofold. One, to conserve lands within the city for open space, environmental, recreational, um, scenic, and or cultural benefits. And then second, to monitor those lands that are conserved to ensure they remain in that natural state and continue to provide the benefits that they were uh, conserved for. And that mission is actually codified in the city code. So generally, the lands that fall under our jurisdiction, they come to us through a variety of ways. And Maria, you can speak to this if, if I'm misspeak here. Uh, one, a private landowner can donate their property to the city for open space or all those benefits I just mentioned. Second, when lands are being developed many times, it's required that a portion of that property be set aside for open space. And a lot of times there's a conservation easement created, which uh, the city and the board holds and we continue to monitor. And then outside of that development process, a landowner uh, could be interested in donating or selling a conservation easement for their property. Uh, and there are some tax benefits they can receive for doing that. So at this point, I think we have over 200 acres that come under our jurisdiction through one of those three methods I just talked about. The majority came as set-asides from development, I believe, over the years. And part of our role in helping to conserve these properties, especially in the past, was to work with city planners to identify the sensitive portions of a property that might be going through the development process and help figure out where an easement might be best suited. We also have reached out to landowners to generate interest in conservation and let them know about the benefits to conserve their land. Again, there's many tax benefits available. And that's something that the board has done in the past and we're hoping to get back up and running now that we have a full board again. So we're excited to get to that part. And I just wanted to share a couple of recent highlights with you and then let you know what we're working on over the next year. Uh, in the past, I guess, 12 months or so, two new properties have come under our jurisdiction. We'll be in charge of monitoring a conservation easement that was set aside as part of a development called the Bay Village Assisted Living Facility, and that's going to be out on Forest Drive across from the Giant. Uh, and then, as you probably read in the paper or have heard through City Council, uh, the city just used program open space monies to purchase about 39 acres from Parkside Preserve Subdivision, and that will be set aside in an easement. So moving forward, we'll continue to monitor those to make sure they stay in their natural state. We're also fortunate to partner with the String of Pearls nonprofit this past year who worked with the Washington Society of Landscape Painters and they painted a number of wonderful pictures of the uh, eased lands that we have here in the city. And those were, I think, exhibited here in City Hall last December and January. 
Yeah, and I think as part of that, the mayor declared December 12th Annapolis Conservancy Board Day, which is pretty nice to have. Uh, we also recently approved a stream restoration project on one of the properties we monitor that's being done by Spot Creek Conservancy and it'll help with the uh, stormwater and water quality goals for the city. Um, I'm excited to mention we've embarked on a partnership with the Environmental Trust and that's to create easements for lands that are currently owned by the city that we want to ensure uh, stay in that natural state into perpetuity. Within the next year, we're going to be doing a bit of rebuilding. Uh, as I mentioned, 2016, I think was the first year we had a full board for a while. We're lucky to have uh, Bayard Miser, who's been working uh, with Maria as an intern, and he's been updating our website, getting all the deeds online, updating our maps, getting us ready to really get going again. And uh, the board over the past couple of months has created a list of characteristics that we'll be using to identify lands that we think could be ideal candidates for mm -hmm. conservation. And Sean Wampler with the city was, was wonderful, created an interactive online GRS platform for us to use so we can help identify those lands with those criteria. We're working to develop outreach materials to inform owners of those lands about the value that they hold and let them know about their options for conserving those properties. And so hopefully by the end of the year or into next year, we'll have identified some properties, put them into some sort of a green space plan uh, and begun reaching out to landowners to see if they're interested in conservation. So a lot of great stuff going on. We've got other little side projects, but that's the bulk of it. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. That's great. Thank you yeah, thanks, thanks for the update. It's been a while sure. since we've heard about it. Of course, we knew about setting the property aside, and we're happy with that. Yeah, it's very it's exciting. Quiet Water Park. I would like to mention um, one thing. When we were talking about the Forest Conservation Act and the um, no net loss, the there was a concept where if a if Mr. Gutwald ever approved somebody to offset on a different property, which I'm not pushing, but he's allowed, he has that authority to allow a developer to build, put trees someplace else. That developer, in theory, would have to reach out on their own right now. And Ms. Broadbent and I have talked about this, of building up essentially some sort of database of what private properties, could be public properties in terms of if school property might have, of course, not ball field space, but other space. Um, churches might have some property. Um, might be lands that no one's been able to buy. Um, parcel on Hilltop right across from Knesset Israel always comes to mind okay. as being a thin, yep. narrow strip where there's just grass. Open. Yeah. Seems to be a hard spot to develop. I think would be perfect for building, yeah. putting trees there. And, and a private owner in that sense might be incentivized by just being familiar with what your program is. And so just, I don't know the status of that. I know Ms. Broadbent and I have talked about it in the past. Mr. Gutwald's aware of that thought process too. Mr. Waldman from the Planning Commission is the one who raised it to me at least. So yeah, take, we'd be happy to look into that, with that and check word. that out. Yeah, Thank you. absolutely. Thank you for the suggestion. Appreciate it. Ms. Broadman, it looked like you were ready to respond. Say something there. No, it's a great it's a great connection working with this board to do that. So that, you know, the characteristics of property are things that we've all talked to the environmental community about. Connection with green space connecting the bike trails, are they wildlife corridors? You know, it's, it's those kinds of things, you know, and as sea levels rise, shoreline property, you know, those, those street end parks, let's make sure that we put them in um, conservation property so they can't be developed later. But right. if they work out that they could also serve to be a planting place for trees so we don't have a net canopy loss when other properties get developed, um, all the better. Great. Thank you again for coming. Thank you. Appreciate the presentation. Ms. Provent, while you're there, you wanted to give us just any uh, um, updates. I'm forgetting the specific update that we had in mind when we listed this as an agenda item. I don't know if it was the DNR response. I think we've already covered that. Uh, so we, we did get the response back from Department of Natural Resources approving the changes to the Forest Conservation Act and no net loss. You know, that was, that was the big one. Um, my Huge. Yeah, that's huge. You know, I did send them the manual, but didn't didn't really get any feedback. Um, you know, we're not told not to do it, so we're you know using the manual. We're using what it, it we're we started with the state's manual as the basis anyway, so it really wasn't all that much different. Very it's good. just applying our code to that information, and, and that's all I really have. We're um, working on a number of different smaller things. We'll probably, we might have some things to share with you on some new Conservancy Board properties pretty soon too. Terrific. 
Thank you. Appreciate all your presentations. Mr. Gutwell, I'm sorry to be pushing you around <laughs> to, down towards the bottom. I was appreciate yeah. I know you have nothing else to do. <laughs> um, if you wouldn't mind giving us an update on uh, forest conservation projects, and of course, I'd love to hear an update on uh, the forest drive slash eastport sector study, if you have an update along those lines. Okay. Uh, first, I'll just run through some of the major highlights from the last month on the forest conservation projects. Uh, 929 West Street, which is just a parking lot, uh, that grading permit has been issued. Um, 2010 West Street, which is the property that is in front of the Capitol building, we have received an uh, FSD, uh, an application for an FSD to review that project or that site at this point in time. Uh, Annapolis Towns at Neal Farm, they have started issuing or bringing in building permits at this point in time for those 50 single family homes. Everything's been approved, but now they're moving through the building permit review process. Uh, the 1750 Forest Drive, everything has been approved, the forest conservation plans and the forest stand delineation, and actually the site development, the minor site design plan. No, I'm sorry, you're, you're losing me now. Which one are you on now? 1750 Forest. 1750, is that it's, it's on page Manigan. one? Page two? Yeah, page three. Page three. 1750, I don't see... Oh, there it is, okay, Manikin. Yeah. Okay. What were you saying about that one? I'm sorry. That everything's been approved on that so far. Wh which property is that? Is that the Mafe building? Which one? Oh, yeah, the the Mafe building. building. Oh, okay. The old Mafe building. Oh, the Mafe building. Okay. 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 Thank you. Sure. Um, and then uh, Parkside Preserve, you heard about that, and we're still, everything's queued up, ready to go, just waiting for the, the final approval. That's at the law office at this point. And okay. And so the grading uh, permit is not issued and it won't has be issued? Not, it's not an initial approval, so it hasn't been issued, correct. And okay. the, the open space is on the Board of Public Works meeting for next right. week. Okay. Okay. Uh, and last but not least, the Public Works Garage off of Spa Road. The grading permit is under review, and actually we just received the, just today or yesterday the building permit. So that's moving forward. Okay. What's happening so to the uh, Rocky Gorge project now that the... Um, access to Iris T. Allen was denied? They're looking to get the, the grading permit, the phase one, the phase two grading permits going through a review process and there's there's been revisions required. So So they're just pursuing it? Pursuing what they had originally. With approved. the old road? Yep. Okay. Um, anything new on the Crystal Spring? It's not called that anymore. I'm blanking on what the new name. Providence Point. Providence Point. Thank you. Providence Anything Point. new on Providence Point? Uh, no, we've met with them, gone through a lot. You know, the forest and delineation obviously has been approved. They're I, anticipating some kind of uh, application in the near future. They acted like it would be the end of last month, but it didn't come in. So. Okay. Uh, okay. And that process would not be through planning and planning commission. Uh, it would be because it would probably be a major a subdivision. Okay. Because so it's a reconsolidation and reconfiguration of the of the lots, but it's a, the CCRC is a special exception, so that would be through the Board of Appeals. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Did I um, see a big um, oil drum being dug up out of the ground at uh, the Eastport Sail Loft? I don't. I know they were putting uh, the lines, water and sewer in from the street, and then I saw all of these uh, contamination trucks there. Huh. And the next thing I saw was a big, uh, yeah. look like oil drum coming out of the water. I haven't heard that one, the, so oh, okay. I can check on it. Yeah, who, I mean, who would be looking at that? Wouldn't it be permits? I mean, yeah, it would be an the inspection. MDE. And then MDE would be the MDE is the per okay. right. permitting for like yeah. an underground fuel tank or any yeah. of that. They just put those tanks anywhere in the old days, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gutwell, any update on uh, Forest Drive oh. Eastport Sector Study? Forest Drive uh, Eastport Sector Study. So we've gone through a series of stakeholder meetings, got uh, you know some good feedback, uh, synthesizing all of that. We've been working with the Planning Commission, um, going having work sessions with them. We had our second work session last night. I thought it was positive. We focused on the economic development because the previous meeting was set up focused on sort of the mobility issues. Um, so we're synthesizing all the comments. Um, we are working on putting together a more defined time frame um, and uh, uh, sec subsequent events. Um, 
and then tonight we're doing more stakeholder meetings uh, to, to offer to anybody. And I think we have of the 36 openings, we have 23 or 24 of them filled for tonight at Pitt Moyer Center. So there'll be three sessions tonight for stakeholders to discuss their, their the comments and thoughts about the forest Pitt drive. Pitt Moyer or forest. Eastport Fire Station? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. <laughs> sorry. I'm thinking <laughs> say, September oh, yeah. 27th meeting is, is the first open house is at the Pitt Moyer. So you're right. I'm sorry. It's the fire station. <laughs> you're correct. I, I, um, conti I continue to get feedback of what you know I just heard about this meeting and I missed it or you know notice I would again encourage you to list as many meetings as currently are scheduled on the website. Two more in August right? I'm um, not aware of any. We started uh, scheduling the um, the open house meetings if you will or the public meetings to the general public and that starts in September. So yeah I'm working on that and also giving more of a directive as to purpose of the meeting, what Perfect. we're going to do with it, and what, what to expect when you arrive kind Thank of you. thing. I so appreciate your attention to those suggestions. Sure. Anything else, members? No, I would just say the attendance of those meetings has been uh, quite active. Yes. <laughs> I understand. Um, we've got two minutes. We have this committee meets, I think, two more times at most before we disband. Um, so we want to continue making the most of it. Um, so yeah, so next meeting is September. I'm assuming we'll have one in October, but it's like a week before the final council session, so who knows what's left to be done at that point. So in September, any uh, desires of what the agenda should look like? Any topics that you want covered? I want to think about it. All right. Mr. Godwalt, any suggestions? No, I'd just be glad to report back on the Forest Drive and Eastport sector Thank study. You. And if you could, help, Maria, as you're thinking about it, if you could also just mention to um, Director Jarrell as well that we just have limited time if he's got anything remaining that he think we should pick up. Okay. Oh, well. Thank you, members. Appreciate everyone's uh, participation today. We got a lot done.